there we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special holiday edition. No, I don't, this special edition. No, it, it is a great edition. Anytime Dean's with us on uh, This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 308. We are about one month away from our um, eighth anniversary. I got seven or eight anniversary, somewhere around there. But we've been doing it for a while. Let's put it that way. Um, and welcome to everyone that's watching us on Roku or Apple TV or Google or Amazon Prime or uh facebook twitter you we name it we're just about everywhere yeah and, and what's that we are omnipotent we are omnipotent we are we're even on twitch we, you know if you're on an xbox you can watch us if you're on a ps5 any playstation you watch us it's i'm sorry uh, i'm still gonna say if you're on a ps5 and you're watching this man you you've you got too much time on your hands <laughs> well that and why are you watching this on ps5 you should be using <laughs> <laughs> There's other things you can do on a PS5, by the way. Strange as it may be. Hey, I, I do I have to, as always, uh, call out the fact of your festive state of shirts. And today, of course, is a wonderful holiday tribute to July 4th. That is a definitely Sis Boom Ba Hawaiian t-shirt. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was debating. We've got the dab cat on here with the fireworks. And I was trying to decide if, if the cat is chasing the fireworks or if the fireworks are pointed at the cat. I'm leaning towards the latter of the two. Same yeah, thing. maybe. I think maybe that's a possibility. <laughs> Although this, the only thing with July 4th is we live close to downtown Cape Coral. So for us, they have their, it's come back this year, which I'm very happy it has. Don't get me wrong. But they're doing their big, but hey, Mr. Doug Gutman. Oh, do hairstyle. Long, long. <laughs> um, so, so they're doing their big fireworks downtown, which we're only one block away from. And it's the big fireworks. It's the huge city fireworks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, our dog, Edison, does not take well to fireworks. So our July 4th will be spent cuddling him with a big fluffy blanket that he likes. Yeah. Uh, hoping that he stays calm and peaceful, even though he's not going to be because those, that, I mean, it, we're, it goes above our heads. I mean, it literally rattles the windows when these things go off. We can, and we have no other place to go because every place that we know of that we can go to, same proximity. So, yeah. You know. But anywho, hey, um, Adele, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you as also. Um, I was just coming on, on on Dean's wonderful festive, as always, uh, Hawaiian, but now currently July 4th-ish. Um, <laughs> and, and, and tribute to our northern neighbors. Happy Canada Day. <laughs> Happy Canada Day, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little worried that I'm, either I have, one, too many clients in Canada, or two, uh, two connected to Canada. There was a picture that was posted on Facebook where it showed all the Mounties on a suspension bridge. And the big question was, where were they? And I'm like, I know where they are. The Capella Bridge over in Vancouver. I mean, for me to know that, I'll tell my I'm like, okay, that means something. I don't know what it means, but it means something. Um, I've grown anyway. very attached to Canada myself. Yes, I've spent, it, I've spent it, so much time there in the last few years. It's, a, it's so beautiful. Toronto is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Vancouver, Whistler, the whole British Columbia area. It, 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 it's just a wonderful place full of wonderful people too. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, they're, they're just the best neighbor ever. Yep, I have to agree. I'm, I'm, I'm biased in that sense too. My family comes from there originally on Nova Scotia side. So, hey, uh, there was a, speaking of which, from a travel perspective, uh, obviously the pressure is being put on, not pressure, the awareness of going to Europe. There's some, Interesting articles I was looking at of the logistics of traveling to Europe right now. It's there's a lot of things you have to plan for that you didn't normally plan for as to the status of travel, whether it's a green country, yellow country, you know, what zone, green zone, red zone, yellow zone, as to what you have to go through for getting in line at the airports, as also to your propensity to get tested, frequency of testing, the time of testing, the quarantine requirements. And, there, and so you have a lot of these conditional things you have to put into your your travel planning. You know, what happens if you go to a country that one minute is green, so you get there and you go through the minimum protocols and all of a sudden turns into uh, you know, yellow, go, uh, amber, whatever. And all of a sudden you're now in a different restriction level. And now you have to extend your stay in that country by X number of days based on the quarantine requirement of the color code that it went into. And, you know, you're, there's no option for you. There's not like, oh, gee, you know, uh, I'm in a bad situation. Let me just get out of the country. It's like, nope, you're there and you have to go through the quarantine. But to me, it seems very, you have to really want to go. Let's put it that way. You just really yeah. have to yeah. want to go. That's a fair statement. And you, you know? need the flexibility, perhaps, you know, yes. the, you, that, that you're not absolutely required to be home. I'll, I'll never forget um, when I was 25, 
I was born in Israel. When I was 25, my parents said, okay, now you can go back to Israel and they won't draft you. But sure enough, when I come to the border and I show my passport and it says, <laughs> they said, okay, um, so you have to report to Sergeant so-and-so because you're going into the army. It took, and, and the, everybody was panicking online behind me. Harvey, they're, 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 kidnapping the girl in front of us <laughs> and and uh it took three military offices before i got out of it but before they finally decided that i was too old <laughs> but they kept saying you know you have you're gonna have i said don't you don't understand i have to be back in my office on monday i'm just here for my grandfather's birthday um and to meet some family and go right back home Call your boss and tell them that you're going to be two years late. <laughs> That's literally what the guy said to me. It was oh, so funny. Wow. It's funny now. Yeah, it's, no, <laughs> at the time it would not have been funny. You know, on any stretch of imagination, it would not have been funny for that. But yeah, um, okay. So I know that there's one <laughs> one topic that I know that Dean had that I definitely want to make sure we hit before we get lost into variations of things and so forth. Because you sent me an email, Dean, and maybe I'll, I'll just leave you to, to, to do the thunder on this one. Go ahead. Share what you shared. <laughs> but, well, so, you know, I'm, I'm involved in many the uh, loyalty programs or rewards programs, whatever you want to call them, uh, including intercontinental hotels. And so I get their email yesterday that they now have intercontinental hotels ambassador program. And you join the ambassador program and a couple of things that happen, by the way, it's $200 per year. So if this starts sounding familiar to something, it should. So it's $200, you join it. And with it, of course, you get perks, you get special rates, and you can effectively buy elite status. And by the way, you get one free night out of the whole thing. So it pays for itself right out the gate. One free night, or close to it, at least, at the very least. And so, you know, it's very similar, I'm thinking, to TripAdvisor Plus. That's what it rings true to. Uh, and a lot of the same thing. So they're really trying to say, hey, we've got our own version of the same thing. But that part about being able to buy the elite status is what really got me. Because if you've ever been uh, an elite level person with whether it be an airline or a hotel or whatever, and then lost that, each of those programs will give you the opportunity to reclaim your elite status by buying your way up. On American Airlines, it's in the thousands of dollars to buy your way up. So for $200 to buy elite status at a hotel program, that's not bad. <laughs> right? I got that email uh, myself, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you looked into it, everything about it. I didn't fully research it, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that sounds very interesting, especially if you get the free night and you would have spent $200 on getting the night. Yeah. Right. And so now I'm that hotel brand and and I'm not trying to put down TripAdvisor Plus, don't misunderstand me here, but mm -hmm. as a hotel brand now, that is now business for me, right? Mm -hmm. That That is my business. I'm getting that. I think it's a brilliant move on their part and I'm curious to see if other programs come out and do something similar. I think that's yeah. a, Go ahead, Adele. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I always say, you know, give give those opportunities where you're going to get a billboard effect from somebody else's website, sending people over to you, but always also give it to yourself first mm -hmm. and give a little bit better on your own program. Sure. First. So I, that's, that's what they're doing. Yeah. I think, I think also the timing is exceptionally good. And I think any, any brand that's in consideration of this, or even those people that have the opportunity to be able to build their branding for this, this is an excellent time because people balance being from the logistics of this is, for your decision is like, just as you described it. Okay. It's 200 bucks a year ago. No, no, I'm, I'm not. As a matter of fact, there were so many things I canceled just because I wasn't going to be traveling. It was like, I'm not going to, I have no need for these things. Um, you know, the, the trippets and all that kind of stuff, you know, the, mm -hmm. Hey, I don't need to be paying for something I'm not going to be using for a while. And there were not a lot of platforms were very smart in making sure they just said, Hey, we understand what's going on. We're just going to push you a year forward. Don't worry about it. You know, they did a lot of them didn't do that, which I thought was a poor decision. Now, as we begin to emerge into the travel process again, for those who are considering travel, um, this is an opportune time to make the validation the way you just described it. Look, I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to be doing that. Wow. If, if for 200 bucks, I get to jump into the seat of those kind of things, get those kind of benefits. 
And knowing where I'm thinking about traveling to, knowing that this is an option for me in that market, that seems to mathematically make sense for me to pay for that. Just like you were talking about, Dale, about signing up for the TripAdvisor Plus program, and things like at, at what, you know, you look at the recuperation of the funds. Like, okay, so if I spend this, what am I getting for this? And if so, do I get it back from what I did plus more of what I can get? And you just made the validation cause that. And you were just like, hey, look, for 200 bucks, I immediately can get this benefit. We all know that from our conversation before, aspirationally, we have higher expectations of our travel. So this adds to that, like, I'm going to get that room that I like. I'm going to get treated the way I think I should be treated, so forth and so on. And so, yeah, it, it makes sense that this is a great time for these types of programs to roll out. And a definite evolution on what things like Hilton started with, oh, yeah, sign up and we give you a different rate. And it kind of never went anywhere. Now, I don't. I wouldn't even blame COVID for that. Hilton was already floundering about not doing something with it prior to COVID. They just were just having you sign up and not really exercising that new relationship much. And the infuriating thing is, I, and I just keep saying this over and over, they, they spent so many millions of dollars promoting it. And then when you call the hotel and say, uh, okay, same rate, uh, same date, same room type, uh, same booking conditions. Can you, can you, you know, see, can you match this thing I have on my mobile phone? I'm sending you the screenshot and they make you go through hell and high water to do it. Nobody is going to do that for a few dollars. Mm -hmm. And it, I was so, I, I, I had gone through that with a, a hotel that was a Hilton brand and it took 24 hours before I got it all sorted. Nobody else would have gone through that. But I just wanted to make sure that that hotelier knew what was going on so that she could fix it. And the next time it was straight and 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 the I didn't have a lower, I didn't show a lower mobile rate on the OTA. But the third time when it happened again and it was $40 more to go direct as a Hilton member, I said, I'm going to go. And I, I went to an IHG hotel mm -hmm. <laughs> and I paid more because yeah. it was just annoying to me. And I, it, it feels like it feels disrespectful. Good, Dean. I'm you know, well, I say, you know, so I'm, I'm going to take an example outside of hospitality here just to be a, a good neutral example, but a surprising one a little bit, actually. So I live in Norfolk, Nebraska, so we don't have a whole ton of retail outlets here. I don't have a Best Buy or a Cabela's or those kind of things, but I have a Walmart. And so our uh, flat screen TV in our living room died uh, last mm -hmm. month. Uh, it was 10 year old TV, LG models, a good TV and everything, but it died. And so we had to get a new one. By the way, if, in case you're wondering, it needed a new motherboard and they don't make them anymore because it's a 10 year old TV. But anyway, so I go to Walmart. I'm doing my shopping. I've shopped online. I find a TV that I kind of like. It's at Walmart. And it's at a great price, right? Uh, but I can't do it that particular night. So I go the next day, I go into Walmart. And as it turns out, the price changed from day one to day two. Uh, the day that I go in there, it's at a different price now. At that location, other Walmart locations in nearby cities still had same make and model in stock at the lower price. This particular location had it in stock, just at a higher price. Guy comes up to me, manager. Well, he wasn't a manager. He's just a Walmart employee working in the electronics department, talking to me about TVs. And we're looking, and he's, and he's very passionate about what he was doing and about his, his tr trade and what he did. And, and he could pull it up on his phone and saw, oh, yeah, I can see right here. It's available at our one over here at that price. He goes to his manager and says, hey, can I give it to this guy for that price? His manager's answer was, do what's right for the customer. He comes back to me, sold me a TV. There you go. <laughs> That's great. And you know what? You're going to remember that forever. Absolutely. And There's I really nothing like that. empowerment. Right? But you know, nothing we, we, like it. We, we've had problems like this before prior to when we first started having that rate issues of uh, best rate guarantee stuff. And they said, oh, well, you know, uh, if you find a different, a, a better rate than what we're offering, you know, then you had to go through this validation process. Well, send us a copy of what you got this. And we we never tr really, truly, and, and on, as an industry and average, trained our front desk staff or those answering the phone how to facilitate those conversations. Because a lot of them were like, Oh, get the get the uh, uh, revenue manager. You know, I don't know how to do this. You know, what, what you know? Am they faxing it to me? Or are they are they uh, sending me an email? What email am I sending it to? I'm not going to do my email. There was no real facilitation to this process. You're sitting there going, "Look, I'm looking at the screen. I got a screen capture. Let me send this to you so I can show you that I can get the same thing I just got." You know, well, without verification, I know. So I want to send you the verification. How do right. I do that? Well, I got to talk to my manager. 
okay, wait, I'm, I'm trying to make a reservation now, not yeah. whenever you get to the person's on, on their, their shift or whatever. And so we, we've already failed at this many times prior to all of this already. And, you know, there are some great organizations that are turning into secondary markets. Like there's a founders club that's out there. They, they, it's not cheap. It's I think 500 bucks to get the card, but it gives you instant uh, platinum status with, um, I think it's Hilton Marriott, IHG, the immediate tiered for them, plus Delta, plus uh, United. I mean, it gives you this immediate high level status for all. So, to your point, Dean, about it, for 500 bucks, if I'm really going to travel and I really need a diversification of opportunity, that $500 turns into a reasonable pay forward kind of mentality of I can get that back for what I'm going to get in benefits in return. Plus right. it has a bunch of other, you know, value propositions, this, that, and you get discount rates on different things and so forth. Early but, check uh, in, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Whatever all the other stuff is, well, you know, in addition to, you know, rental cars and, you know, restaurant venues and, and, and all this other kind of stuff. It was kind of like this massive value proposition all wrapped up together in one. And, and I, I actually challenge some of these destination markets when we get more to a competitive mindset again, of how can you create that own environment for your business to say, I can offer these value adds if you were to be with us? Like if you come with us, you know, the, the old coupon book mentality, you know, that uh, what can I give you as value adds if you stay? Like I can give you a discount at the, these restaurants or discount at these venues or discount at these events or whatever, if that's a part of what your destination purpose is. Uh, okay, but so now we've got, we, and we've talked about this example with uh, with Intercontinental Hotels Group. Okay, great. So they've got their ambassador club. Uh, we talked about TripAdvisor Plus has got their plus program and so forth. What happens now when a Hilton and a Marriott and a Wyndham and everybody else down the list is, got an episode of science, so what happens when they have their variation of the same thing? Now all of a sudden, everybody's got a $100, $200 club you can join. You can't join all of them. Mm -mm. Uh, does that then at some point force you to become loyal to a brand? Because I can't join all of them because they're not free anymore, right? right? But I get I get better perks, but they're not free. So now I've got to pick one. Well, I, you know what? I don't know if I agree if the cost of signing up is covered by something you've received immediately. So in the case of IHG, I pay my $200, I get a free night at a Kimpton, and I'm done. I, 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 there's no skin off my nose on that, but yeah. I have this benefit now, and I haven't lost any money on that deal. So I am free to invest in another if there's a place where um, – an independent property or, or, or another chain is, is better for me. Sure. But that's going to depend upon how much are you traveling? So mm -hmm. I can look at the IHG thing and say, Hey, you know, you're the first one to the gate. You, if I do this right now, yeah. Okay. I think I might travel enough in the next year to make that worthwhile. Am I traveling enough to make that worthwhile for a second one, a third one, a fourth one, uh, a fifth one? Whew, probably not. <laughs> yeah. You know, you you just may have created a cottage business. If, you know, okay. So if you, if you guys are both going back and forth. First off, by the way, Adele, I am going to regret. I think that is the first time you've disagreed in a long time. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but you Normally know you're the most amicable. Just... Like, sure, that's great. But that's the first time. I think I disagree. So I'm. I applaud. Please keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> because because I mean that's just the way I would view it. Because I would think. I I got what I I put the money in and I got my I got my thing back and I'm even. Yeah. I I I'm not out any money because I I got my free night. So there's no skin off my nose. I uh, I I've, I've got it. So will I be more inclined to take a look if there is an IHG that will work for me? I think so, yeah. but if it doesn't work for me, I'm not going to push myself to do something that's inconvenient because I, in order to return, uh, to get the return, because I, I already got what I, I already got what I paid for. Well, but you, it, you, think, you, know, you think there's people out there like the points guy and stuff like this. That's just his business. This is what he does. He compares, and he's unfortunately for me, he's kind of jumped the shark for me because most of everything he posts now is because it's sponsored and or solicited by a company that he gets compensation for before when he first started, it was really cool. 
because he really kind of laid it against each other based on what you could get from the average Joe that was running around doing the stuff. Now it's more like, and American Express has this amazing deal. Oh, by the way, this is brought by American Express. It's like, okay. Um, but what you're just describing is kind of interesting because now for me to make the evaluation, to Dean, your point, I'll, I'll make one other country. What I'm more concerned about is all the people that didn't pay to get the extra level, how are they going to be treated in deference now? Ooh, good question. Okay. Yeah. Because now it's like, oh, I get my free bottle of water after I've been with you a thousand times. Yay. Meanwhile, this guy comes strolling in and getting benefits that I think I earned for the frequency that I've been there, but I didn't pay the extra to get that extra. Oh, he gets to be walked up while I still have to sit in the lobby waiting for my room to be ready or whatever else value comes to all these things. So I think there's a blowback potential to this as well. But the cottage industry I'm thinking about is if I'm looking to invest, because not everybody has total travel plans for, you know, where they're going to say, oh, I'm going to just pick IHG and Hilton and Marriott. I'm going to pay all these $200. Even if in compensation, as you said, Adele, I get a value immediately that compensates for the monies, I may not be traveling up. Uh, but I might think that there might be a whole new level of research that says, okay, where do I want to go? And look at the lists of each of the companies to see if there's inventory related to my interests to determine which one would be my preference. Maybe, you know, you know and look and say, well, I, she has the best thing and I could really get all those things that they say, but only two of the places I plan on going in the next year or whatever are really, uh, they have a place. Other than that, that's the only place that I can redeem that. Hmm. Compared yeah. to Marriott that has a lot more places, but, you know, anyway, go ahead. But you know what? I just, I, I just, I don't make a decision in advance. I'm looking at going to Dallas and there happens to be next to the, the convention center where the HSMA uh, commercial week is going to be happening. Everybody who's watching this, you should definitely look into going. It's going to be so, so good. Um, and, and it's a preferred hotel. So of course I, sign up for the preferred thing. That's uh, that's why I do it at the time that I'm booking it. Um, I don't sign up in advance wondering where I'm going to be going later. Sure. I just want to get the benefit now because I don't want to happen to me what happened to me last time where I stayed like a million times at, uh, what was it? Um, I can't even think of what the what the brand is, uh, an Asian brand, and and I Mandarin? thought, oh, I'll never go, I'll never, I'll never go to Asia, so I'll never be able to take mm. advantage of that. And then I went and stayed at several of those hotels, and wish I had had that status sure. on my record. But sure. well, it's the same thing <laughs> like American Express Platinum and stuff. Go ahead, Dean. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. By the way, speaking of HSMEI in Dallas at the end of September, high tech HSMEI. <laughs> Uh, or just being in Dallas, everybody, you ought to be there. That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's room blocks, of course, associated with the event. Uh, don't be afraid to look outside of the room blocks. There are a lot of hotels in downtown Dallas that have some really good rates during that time period. Mm -hmm. And also, as a mind for though, having lived in Dallas, both of us, is that uh, you know there's a there's a light rail system that's very efficient and depending upon venue and space you can be not next to things but the the light rail will bring you there pretty easily yeah. so don't think that you got to do a walking distance thing when in fact light rail can get you pretty much anywhere and you can live you can actually get to enjoy aspects of the Dallas metro area um, that you would not normally just simply by the fact you're staying out in the more there's no such thing as a suburb of Dallas it's like Dallas is. <laughs> It's a metroplex. It's a yeah. metroplex of every place. You yes. know, there, it doesn't really end as you go from one place to the next. Plano to Frisco to Allen to everybody else is just it's transition of neighborhoods with different signs. It's it's all the same thing in that sense. So yeah, I remember when I was um, a sales manager at the Adolphus Hotel in Dallas. Mm. I could get to most of my sales calls on the underground go tunnel through the underground, then go to a sky bridge, then go back down again, <laughs> then go up again, cross the street, go back down again. And because of the heat, not because of, you know, not because of uh, that I didn't enjoy being outside, but, you know, just to stay fresh. <laughs> you know, I wonder, do you ever connect the underground with the convention center? That's what I don't know. But I, oh gosh, now I wish I could remember the name of the hotel that I booked um, in uh, in Dallas. But uh, 
Lorenzo, maybe? Oh, Lorenzo Hotel, yeah. Well, they say that they're like next door to the convention center. They, they and it's a preferred. On the other side of the interstate next door. <laughs> okay. Maybe they have a shuttle thing or something to help get you across. Well, the, 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 nice part, now, the nice part about what's coming up in September that we all keep referring to, of course, is high tech, the Hospitality Industry Technology Association, you know, um, HSFTP, HFTP actually runs it, but high tech is the name of the event, is probably the first introduction back into the venues of the industry coming back together in a large population. The other, of course, is HSMI has always tied their rock conference to it, and well, not always, past four years. And they're continuing to do that, but they're also have added the marketing conference to it as well. So there's a whole week solid of things, how it mixes as to how they compete or, you know, time schedule wise, who's to know. I think most of us are interested in it from the perspective of group hugs, you know, and, uh, <laughs> seeing everybody and, and networking and being one on one with people that we haven't seen for over a year and a half. So by them, you know, even longer. So I think that's the, the real part of it. But I kind of grabbed an article out related to the fact that technology is something that we talked about during COVID that, you know, this is the time to do your tech stack and the heavy lifting stuff and the upgrading yourself because the world has changed and some things have advanced. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the articles I grabbed out was uh, five connectivity solutions that hotels should invest in now from a hotel management article. And I'll rattle them off real quick and see what you guys think about these. And we can always go back to any one. Um, Delivering the Wi-Fi lifeline, making sure that your Wi-Fi is as broad and as capable as possible. That's number one. Definitely. Number two, the power of environmental monitoring solutions, which I thought was an interesting placement where it's talking about this is the time to upgrade your technology for your HVAC programs. One is, if anything, we've come to notice is that, well, we'll get back to this, but anyway, that's number two. Number three, CCTV provide top security, increasing your security systems, your visualization, your camera work, and so forth. Okay. Number four, the value of cellular boosting. This is an underrated one that I think is great that they put into this list because cellular boosting is often not considered the responsibility of the hotel. They kind of defer to it like, hey, that's somebody else's issue. We're, you know, whatever. And number five, leveraging bids, building intelligence. And this goes back into the, and it seems relatively timely given what's happened in Miami, the tragedy in Miami, uh, South Beach and, and Surfside, is uh, being uh, aware of your building structure in the sense of in energy usage, uh, water usage, uh, power use, you know, you know not say energy, but you know, all the functionalities of maintaining a structure. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Those are the five that they pointed out to. We can hit anyone individually, but Wi Fi, environmental monitoring, uh, CCTVs, cellular boosting and, and building intelligence. Um, I'll leave it at that and you guys can hit and then we can go back to something in particular if you want. Well, what, the one that stands out to me, and by the way, I did a, a very informal poll on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago where I asked about what are your deal breakers when you're staying at a hotel? And I included out uh, strong Wi-Fi, free breakfast, water pressure in the shower, and courteous staff. You can only do four choices on a LinkedIn poll, so I had to cut it off there, but there were a lot of other comments in the in the comments. The winner by far, I mean, wasn't even close, was strong Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty 150 yeah. votes. So yeah, well, we I got think the cellular on. though goes right with it, right? That's fair, yeah. Because if if somebody's calling you and, and they go, I didn't get the call, or if I'm trying to answer a call and they can't hear me or whatever, it's absolutely a deal breaker. You never want to go through that again. And I've been at hotels that have had that kind of problem. It's it's so debilitating. It's also debilitating for the staff. Imagine if you have offices in the basement or in some corner where you don't have good coverage. It's mm -hmm. extraordinarily frustrating for your team mm -hmm. to try. It's like it's it's like they're shackled. They're trying to do their job and they can't. I know Melissa's in the audience. And I know they've had that as a part of the fuel travel. Uh, well, you know, there's not fuel travel anymore. It's fuel travel. Travel boom. Travel boom. Travel boom. Travel boom. Travel boom. Travel boom. Yeah, right. All right. Sorry, <laughs> Melissa. Just trying to remember the new name thing. Um, travel boom. But there, the when there were, were fewer travel and they were doing the surveys, uh, the Wi-Fi was a persistent uh, comment that was made out of them also as well. But you know, it, I still remember to this day, I, I, I spoofed this group. I was doing a presentation for a large or, or ownership group, and it was at their conference hotel. 
And uh, the conference hotel was relatively isolated. It wasn't in a major metro. It was in a secondary market. And I was trying to make a point of what technology could do. And so I found out that they had a cell booster, a, re a, a relay at the conference center because it was outside of the cell phone tower coverage and they were smart enough to have put in a repeater. So I talked to their IT tech and said, can you do me a favor? Can you send this text at this time to everybody that's connected to the repeater? Which you can do. But people don't realize that you're relying on a private tower, basically, to connect you to the general cellular network. And so I was making a point to uh, the presentation and I said, and for that, let me send you all a message. And I tried to time it as close as I could to what I did it. And it paused for about five seconds. People were like, what? And all of a sudden, everybody's phone got a text message saying, this is the power of technology. Freaked them out. But repeaters, you have control over who's connected to your network should you choose to. It's a dangerous world. I mean, <laughs> we, we often forget how who we don't. Because you see Verizon or you see AT&T or you see T-Mobile, and you think that's what you're connected to, and you are, but how you get there via something is often the question of what your phone decides to connect to. And its purpose is to connect to the next strongest signal. And so if you put a repeater up that, that boosts cell phone tower capability in your market to go to your carrier, you're running through somebody else's network. So from a security perspective, you have to make sure that if you're doing that, that you have to follow all the protocols associated with all the other things, because you can, the sad part of it is, is if you look at a repeater, you can literally see that this is how people will go to the coffee shops and they spoof, you know, other people, they act like the Wi-Fi of another place. Well, that's different, but I mean, same mentality. Um, and also, too, from a cell phone perspective, they create a carrier, you know, that people can, their phone connects to. And now they're running through it to get to their service. But they're, they're going through a middleman now at that point. And that middleman can literally, if you don't have the proper security in place, see a lot of information. Fortunately, a lot of information is slowly getting blocked, but still a lot goes through because you don't think about it, you know. So, right. yes, yeah. But, but cell phone tower, to your point, if you don't have that extra boost in it, if you do have issues uh, about it, and, and I know, Dell, you know better than I do, even in New York, you would think that it would be the mecca of high cellular coverage. But there's no, there's buildings that just suck up the signal and there's just you get in certain corners or certain aspects of it there's not a single a sing, a single well, yeah. signal to be found <laughs> it, it's hard to push signals through buildings yeah yeah but yeah to that end but I, I i did think it was kind of interesting that they put in this top five the focus on the buildings and the environment stuff because i would not have considered them in that dialogue well the hvac especially over a year ago i don't think that would have been of any predominant concern that people were monitoring their, their HVACs. Um, but I think from the fact that we are going to be battling this, this uh, aspect of whether it be coronavirus or something else or very deviants or variants of it or not, people are, it's in their mindset when they travel now. They want to know a little bit more about what the hotel is doing. Even if we're less mindful of it, we're still aware of it. And, 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 you know, what, what are you doing for sanitation? What are you doing for clean air? Because we all pretty much have defined that it's not surfaces so much as it is airborne. So from an HV, HVAC perspective, what is it that's being done to better the environment? It's probably something that's worthy of consideration. Um, and then, of course, you know, the tragedy in the surf side. It's you know, so sad that uh, people said that they took pictures of the, you know, things that were rotting years ago and nobody listened you know it, it's, it, it, it's it, it gets it, yeah it, it, it and that goes to everything that we do we get caught up in this this uh, circular conversations of well who's responsible why should they be responsible what you know uh, I, I just for me i know i've brought it up on the show a couple of times and also on, on clubhouse many many times as i go through all these different insurance renewals that i do you know the the the, the data and the, the digital and cybersecurity and everything like this as also liabilities and so forth it is amazing what we forget is is that these legal firms constantly chip away at the laws to interpret what the laws actually mean right. the torts and things like this that control how we do things and they give themselves so many ways out. Matter of fact, I just made the news the other day of uh, when there's a, a faulty product, and we made it locally here, you would think that the, the uh, federal government that oversees this would be aware of this. But the way the law was 
adapted was first it was if there was ever an instance where somebody was injured because of a product uh, malfunction, they were supposed to be notified. That got modified to only if three uh, litigations proving to be successful to the, per the plaintiffs that brought it, then it would be notified to the federal government that it was actually an issue for product development, that there was a manufacturer's default to it, as long as it happened within two years, which that litigation lasts more than two years. So one out of like 60 or 80 or some number they gave us actually actually makes it to the agency that's supposed to oversee product uh, malfeasance as to what they, they operate as, simply because they created so many filters where it doesn't apply that they doesn't make it up to their level. Because the lawyers kept going in and chiseling at those different rules that made it so that it didn't get to the agency that's supposed to be overseeing this stuff. So people do get hurt with products, you know, nail guns that shoot sideways kind of things. They are, and because they could never get enough litigation against them. Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> but it's just crazy things like that, that we, we don't really realize. I mean, I'm, I'm like looking at the insurance coverage policies and I'm looking at one for a liability or something. Or it's like, this is not worth the dollars we're spending on this. There's an absolutely no coverage to this. There's so many exceptions to it that there's no coverage to it. It's like, unless this exact thing happens in exactly this way, and we exactly notify them at exactly this time, we don't get any coverage for this. It's, it's, it's mind numbing. But meanwhile, companies are demanding that if you don't have insurance, you can't do this. I'm like, I got to pay this, even though literally there's not anything worth the value of the coverage of it by the time it's said and done. It's, it's, like, it's, the, it's like the great email I got yesterday from Office Depot, 25% off sale excludes and a long list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh, great! So I can buy any race. A pencil. A pencil. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only are the families who lost, you know, 150 missing people, and those that who were who were found but not with us, and I mean, there there's so much tragedy there, and those all those homes. Mm -hmm. It's just stuff. But even the people who were in the, the complex who it didn't fall down, mm -hmm. how are you going to sell that? I mean, you're never going to, oh. you, you paid oh, a fortune no. to buy yeah. that property. It is worth nothing now. Mm -mm. And then yeah. I heard some of those people didn't want to leave their home. I'm sorry, if the building right next to me just collapsed, I'm out. <laughs> Especially, especially if it's built the same time by the same people. You're the right. Same, like, Crazy. Even now. <laughs> Might be time to go. <laughs> it, it, it is. There, there's a lot of tragedies at many levels for all of this. And, and this kind of goes back to uh, the responsibility of us in the industry as well, is that these kind of things go through this the social psyche of people when they travel. And, you know, you go to buildings now and you think maybe differently of them, even just even if it fades after time, because the, all things fade in our news media, you know. Yeah. Um, but but the idea of it is until it happens again, unfortunately, because it was never fixed correctly. But we do have some stronger lingering effects from the con ongoing COVID pandemic right now. And that is people do have an awareness of cleaning protocols that they did not have before. And whether that has subsided from its initial hype and height and height to where it is now and you know what have you, um, we're going through the fact that, that we're going through a different variation of that. There's there, there's the Delta variants and things like this that we see in the news, and and then we see the the repercussions of that from uh, how our industry is reacting. And I almost feel like our industry is not reacting to it anymore. They want to get past it. They don't want to refer to it anymore. They don't want pictures of people with masks anymore. They don't want to talk about what they're doing for cleaning anymore. They don't want to talk about what their protocols are anymore. They want to get be like, it's travel time. And, and they're trying to downplay it. I don't think to our benefit. I don't, th I think an awareness, a healthy awareness of, of it is good, but I don't think a, a harboring of it or a paranoia of it is, is good either. I don't think that the, the, the over -func focusing on it is there. I don't know. What do you guys, I mean, do you think we're, paying enough attention to it as an industry or do you think we've tried to downplay it more than, than uh, anything? I don't know. You know, I mean, there are a lot of hotels. I look at reviews every day, just exploring the range of hotels there are in, in the world. And uh, there are still so many hotels that are getting comments filthy, filthy, mm -hmm. filthy, filthy, filthy. Uh, it is 
it is very common, you know, maybe a, a, among us who are maybe used to a certain level of, a, of luxury hotel. But, you know, even, even, uh, even though I may have experienced a lot of five-star luxury hotels, doesn't mean I don't stay at some really basic hotels mm -hmm. as well. Um, just depending on what my need is. I just don't need to pay more for more fancy when I just need to get a place to sleep that's going to be comfortable and smell good and with a, a nice friendly face. It's really sad how much that's true. So I think if you think that everybody is so obsessed with the cleanliness, you're in a bubble mm -hmm. of a particular kind of hotel that you're used to staying in. Not every ho not every hotel is anywhere near as clean as it should be. Sadly mm -hmm. to That's say, very true. and I'm sure that the I'm I'm sure that the labor shortage is impacting that. But that this is not something that I don't I think you can cut corners on. Look, if you if you're a hotel that's had cleanliness issues for the past three years, you didn't just magically change that all of a sudden in the last nine months. Right. You, you know that's a pattern. So, look, if if they were bad before, they probably still are today. They probably just put some uh, hand sanitizer stations in somewhere and some stuff on their website to make it look like they were complying with some standard that somebody made up and can't can't enforce anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. But, Lauren, to your point, I, I think that there is a delicate line to walk in there because on one hand, A, yeah, I do kind of want to know that I'm safe. and I do want to kind of know that you're taking precautions. Uh, in a reasonable hotel, we'll call it, you know, a, a hotel that I would expect to do stuff. Um, but at the same time, yeah, this whole let's get out and party attitude is definitely out there. And it's a boom for us right now, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is getting a lot of travel. I saw a thing on the news the other day that talked about Red Rock Amphitheater in Colorado, in Denver area there, and, and how they had to close down the whole thing in 2020. And now they've got sold out shows again people in packed into the amphitheater, no mask, no nothing. And right. you know, it's game on, party on, everybody's good. And that's the attitude everybody wants to convey. We just had College World Series in Omaha. That was a heck of a boon. My gosh, this, Omaha, Nebraska lost so much money off of that last year. They mm -hmm. needed it. They're desperate for it. So yeah, on one hand, we want everybody to feel like time to go. But where do you cross that line? Where do you balance that line of time to go? But don't be an idiot. Yeah, yeah nobody wants to. Nobody wants to live like that. So if you don't want to live worried about, uh, you know, worried about how people in your community are going to get COVID, not to mention the flu and other things that are also serious, um, which are all on the uprise again because COVID cases went up again, uh, everybody's got to get vaccinated and take it more seriously. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, mm -hmm. and one side effect, talk about the flu and the cases of that. One side effect of the mask wearing is that cases of the flu, and I don't mean this as a conspiracy theory thing, it's actually legit, right? Cases of the flu and the common cold, for that matter, all went down dramatically. And I'm not saying that as because, oh, well, it was diagnosed as COVID and it was actually, no, it's because we were wearing a mask that not just COVID, but all these other things that are very spreadable mm -hmm. were practically non-existent because we were all wearing a mask. Yeah. Now, I'm not a fan of wearing a mask, don't get me wrong, so I'm not trying to say that, oh, we should all wear a mask from now on. No, but that doesn't change the fact that it did have an effect. Yeah, I, I do think we should probably find nicer things to do than shaking hands. My mm -hmm. husband is, is, is beginning to go like this and I, and I go, no, no, elbow, elbow. <laughs> just because we're vaccinated doesn't mean everybody else is. It's just, well, they should be. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know what? I, I was very interested in, though in, uh, in the one thing that you said about the, the CCTV Mm -hmm. that they, that's the security cameras, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So uh, in in what I do at the hotels for um, finding out the root causes of problems, finding out the truth behind uh, a lot of uh, guest comments, uh, you know, I go right to that camera. It is so informative. It really 
uh, it really clarifies sometimes who's, you know, whether the employee side of the story or the guest side of the story seems to, you know what, it's there, it's, I don't think it's intentional. It's just that that's the way they remember it. And people's memories aren't as good as cameras. So it's just great to be able to go back to that. And it's also great to see those cameras when somebody says, nobody cleaned uh, my room for three days. And, and we go to the camera and we can see that the housekeeper went to that door made the 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 you know looked at the camera made the 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 symbol of this this door has a do not uh go in or privacy requested sign on it and and left a note and so we have we have it record on camera that that person went to that door that was that was not a forgotten room and people just don't uh, it, it's so great to be able to protect your staff they say somebody must have come into my room and taken something and we can see that nobody we can see on the camera that nobody went into that room so it's it's so good for also um you know, sadly, hotels are very often involved in human trafficking issues. Mm -hmm. And it's so good to be able to see those cameras. It's so makes it so much safer for our teams and for our guests. I'm, I think that everybody should invest in that. It's so important. It is uh, unique in the sense that we, we, we have the things like ring and so forth and so many, uh, um, uh, platforms now that you can have your own personal security cameras for. And there is a, a lot of technology that has grown up very fast in the sense of uh, some of the prohibitors of CCTV and so forth was uh, the, the requiring of the hardware necessary for it to operate. And 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 the prohibitiveness of, you know, well, I got to run all these wires and all this other stuff. Um, you can do it wirelessly now. You can do it where they only need a power source or no power source at all. But then, of course, you have batteries and needs to recharge and so forth. But then comes in the security concerns because obviously those things can get hacked. They can get brought, you know, connected to if they're not installed correctly. And unfortunately, with all things, even installed correctly, if you have a well knowledgeable hacker, that if they really truly want to break into it, something's always going to be able to be broken into in some capacity. Mm -hmm. We've had that conversation before. So there are there are the value proposition of security cameras. I think is valid. Exactly what you just said, uh, Adele, is that we all see uh, from our perspective what happened you know i can't you know but then once you review it you're like well you may have had that mental attitude but look at your posture and look what you did that's why the other person reacted the way they did or whatever and and just from a, a, a staff security and and validation and monitoring and so forth because it's sad to say but uh we've emerged uh, we're not out of COVID. we have come from our isolation into a very violent society right now overall you know, gun usage and road rage and and intolerance and lack of courtesy to our fellow man seems to be the newsworthy features consistently. It is an unfortunate circumstance as to this pend up, this frustration that we had through this. And we even talked about it on the show many times before about this uh, teaching of our staff to handle, um, you know, guests that might be overly responsive to to things that normally shouldn't upset them, but they go into a tizzy for, you know, like I keep using the example of, you know, the free coffee in the lobby running out and the person going and having a, a hissy. We see it on airlines, you know, punching an attendant. When did that ever happen as a thing? When did it's that ever, I don't remember until recently yeah. that ever being a thing that you would even touch a, a, a staff member on a plane. I mean, it just it, it's mind numbing the the intolerance that people have decided that they feel that they're entitled to. Um, and, and so, yes, we are in that world. We have to be mindful that we don't know how some people will react where you think your well-intended response to their frustration turns into being a very bad circumstance. And that's where cameras become incredibly valuable because yeah. people are like, well, they, they, they attacked me. No, he looks like he just got hit by you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Also, also, uh, sometimes you need to report something to the police and it's so mm. helpful for them to say, oh yeah, we know this guy because we saw it at three other hotels yeah. and, 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 you know, we, we have a plan of how to find that person. It's, 
I, I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about what the, um, what the precautions would be regarding the security, you know, the cybersecurity aspect of it, mm. but in terms of how helpful it is to have it, uh, in your corridors, it's, it sells your staff. We've got your back, mm. yeah. you know, you're, you're exposed to all this, but at least, you know, we're with you in some way. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're trying to make sure that you're covered. So speaking of high tech, uh, a couple of years, oh, more than a couple of years now, three or four years ago, I think Philips or somebody else had a big booth at high tech. And what they did was they were tracking people that walked by their booth. They had a huge booth and the cameras are facing at all angles and they were showing their facial recognition technology and uh, spooked the heck out of people to the point where, um, they stopped showing it at the show about what they knew about the person because it would really make people nervous because they were starting to see the same faces so they could tell frequency of their path, tra tra traffic patterns and who they were and they could identify them over periods of time based upon their interaction with the booth and so forth. And it made people very, very nervous. And that was about the time where things started coming up about how um, facial recognition and invasion of privacy concerns and at a hotel, do you really want to be able to have that capability in your lobby? It, it, isn't that pro confidential information? That's about that whole time that that conversation was running for and stuff. That, yeah, technology is you know scary, and we can see by China how bad it can be abused too. I mean, their whole social scoring system, which we've talked about mm. in times past, where uh, you have a government uh, assigned score, and based upon what they think you do or don't do according to their criteria changes that score. You can't change it. It's only changed by them. And all of a sudden, because you went to the liquor store more often than they think you should, or were or hanging around people that you shouldn't be hanging around, your social score goes down and you can't get train tickets or you can't get certain rental or mortgages or things like this because your score is depleted because of your um, bad behavior in their perspective. What um, a nightmare. I can't is, even it imagine is. being in a dictatorship. It's crazy yeah they want yeah yeah it truly is um, um I, I i meant to bring my american flag to wave it on yeah show. right <laughs> and that one, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Imagine me waving it. <laughs> <laughs> there's another happy hotel management article you can tell i was reading hotel management this uh, today um that I thought would be kind of fun to throw into the conversation is why it's time to rethink your comp set. To me, it was a duh moment. <laughs> like, really? You're bringing this article up now? Um, but the the uh, reality of it is, is the, some of the points that they made were good points to reiterate in general. I'm going to put the link down here just so that you guys can see it. Um, they, they brought up some interesting points. I'll just read through them relatively quickly. Who do you really compete against? Um, it refers to the COVID variant as to how it has changed your comp set. Um, the reality that five to eight hotels in your competitive set do not make up your market, which has always been a true statement regardless of COVID. Okay. Um, that comp sets in the best of times are an inherent myopa, which, you know, uh, you know yes, you're very much looking at a very granular singular perspective on things. Uh, so yes, to the same reiteration of five date hotels are not your full competitive set. Also, too, by only looking at certain hotels in your market, you're ignoring all the other influencing markets that are trying to compete with your market as well. Um, and the reality that meetings are smaller, organizations are smaller in their demand. And as such, the quantifier as to the market influence of comp sets as to how you compare yourself against meeting space and so forth, which I thought was one of the more intriguing points that they made out, should be reevaluated. Is it a real criteria usage in your comp set analysis as much as it used to be? No. You know, the fact that I have 10,000 square foot of meeting space and I made comp sets related to other industries or in other hotels or facilities that had similar comp space or, or open common space size may not be a strong influencing factor in the current market of comp set because that isn't an influencing factor in market choice at this point, which I thought was an interesting point that they did make. Um, and also, and this is a Captain Obvious statement, your customers don't know who your comp set is, nor do they care. Um, I thought those were really good points made out of it that we create our own, uh, what is it, is Stuart still here? Yeah, Par paradigms, I guess it's my word. Um, <laughs> you know, because we put self limits on ourselves. Oh, we, we should only compare ourselves to these hotels because they have the same common space as us. That's not a big thing right now. 
uh, I mean, and, and, and people don't tend to change things. Well, we've been having this comp set since we opened five years ago. We're not going to change it. Okay, so how is it benefiting your data analysis if your your your, comp, your competitive analysis is stale to an old comparison that didn't maybe have value at one point, but doesn't have the same value now? You know, how does that change your influences? Go ahead, Dale, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, not at all. Sorry. Um, people sometimes limit it themselves to a particular location. And, you know, people aren't necessarily deciding that they're going to a location. They just are deciding they want a particular experience. And that experience um, could be, should I go to this hotel in Paris or this hotel in Budapest? It's not necessarily even based on the location. They're just, they just want to be uh, in a city, exploring culture with good food and beautiful views and, uh, you know, something romantic. And it is has nothing to do with the location. So that is that is the number one place where I say, you know, we've got to break that barrier. It, they, not everybody has decided on the destination first and then the hotel. Many people they look on Instagram and they see beautiful pictures of a property and they say, Ooh, I want to go there. I wonder what country it's in. Well, and when we talk about your comp set, that comp competitive, right? Who's my competitive set? And you can compete in many different areas. Uh, so we were just talking about high tech, right? So the K Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center, hopefully I said that right, the Omni Hotel there, uh, that Omni Hotel might be competing against the convention center hotel in Las Vegas and the one in Minneapolis and the one in, mm -hmm. in uh, Orlando, right? So they're competing against other convention centers in different cities. Uh, at the same time, the La Quinta down the street there might be competing with people within the same block there, uh, just within my that specific location. Uh, are you competing on rate? Are you looking at my rate comp set? And then how do I compare that? Is that hotel over there actually comparable to me? Maybe, maybe not. Right. And so there's so many different dynamics to defining a comp set. I, I think that what you, you know, you, you, yes, you kind of got to have a comp set, but really what you have to understand is your, your market and where do you sit within your market as a whole? And your market may not just be your city block. I, I often wonder whether or not, um, given current circumstances, the traditional ways we look at comp sets, you know, uh, equal market a meeting space equal inventory uh same relative marketing tier as to where you place yourself in sense of brand competition and or proximity and those variables as valid as most of them still are some of them are not in my perspective and where where what other ones would you suggest would be considerations to evaluate your idea of who you're competing with? What are I mean, you mentioned some market to market competitions, which are you can't make comp sets out of similar cities but based on star report, let's say. You just can't say I'm gonna pick a hotel over another city. They're only gonna allow you into your your geographic area to pull. What are some other considerations if you had your druthers that you would say are worthy considerations of evaluating a comp set creation? No, really, the question is who's taking your business? Okay. If they're taking, and so really case in point, man, actually Robert's uh, article or his uh, list of articles just came out. And one of the things mm -hmm. that he talked about is scanning it very quickly was about how some of your urban areas are actually down right now versus 2019, while places that they're going to are up. So case in point, uh, one of the ones he said was in Florida. I think it was Tampa, if I remember right. Uh, Tampa. As a, as a market is seeing a boon, right? Uh, Myrtle Beach, our, our friend Stuart in Myrtle Beach, right? Uh, they're, they're seeing a boon. New York is not. So just first of all, as a market, your comp set becomes Myrtle Beach. So now take that down to a property level. If that guest would have previously been coming to you and now they're instead going to that hotel in, in Myrtle Beach, guess what? That hotel in Myrtle Beach just became your comp set. If you're losing business to somebody else, that becomes your competitor. Now, maybe you're not the right fit for that guest. You also have to realize that just because you're, so I'm going to contradict myself here. Just because I'm losing guests to that other hotel doesn't necessarily mean that I should be competing with them on the other hand, because 
If I am a city center urban hotel, for example, and I'm losing business to a guest who's going to Yosemite National Park, you know what? That guest was probably never the right guest for me to begin with. So you have to understand what is your dynamic? What is your demographic? Who is similar to you and is taking your business from you? And use that information to start kind of creating that comp set profile. Yeah. Lot to unpack. So I agree on the con the conditional who can might be still your business. I think that there is a certain layer of of that, and, and I think really what you're suggesting from my my perspective is that you have to create a, a initial filter of who am I competing? I used to call them symbiotic markets. Uh, and my case of example was when I was doing hotels in Key West, I was competing with Aspen, Colorado. And you may say, what? You know, yeah. but it was the demographics were the ones I was competing with. Did Biffy and Buffy want to take a beach trip or did they want to take a ski trip? Okay, yeah. just to be yeah. contrite. Um, and so I was dealing with demographic competitors as to the selective choice of what their interest was. At that point then I was competing the next level was what other beach destinations, Caribbean and or not, domestic or not, that they would have as options based on, again, demographic incomes, age groups, things like this. I was still in that realm of getting the person's focus of discovery towards me. Then when they finally did decide that Key West was an option of consideration, then I started getting into the realm of what we're talking about is the comp set of who am I competing with in oh. market that would be taking my business. Like, okay, amenities to amenities, proximity to proximity, location to location, value to value, where am I now competing against in my market? That's when we start dealing with star reports and all these other ones. I'm not a big fan of Calibre, but I know others are. Um, but data like that, uh, that would show you some sort of evaluation as to what people were in the market. I say, and also something you mentioned, that I think when you pointed to New York in comparison to Myrtle Beach, I think it's, I would attribute that more to a latency of data than I would be of current interest. Uh, looking at data, I would agree with you. The Myrtle Beaches, the Tampas, and so forth, as Robert referred to in his conversation, historical data, they had more of a venue of opportunity. New York had purposely just been closed and they just now opened. So I would say that I, from a marketing perspective, I would go into the research history of how many people were really interested in going to New York, but there was nothing to sell. That's there was fair. no Broadway, there was no anything, there was nothing really open to go do. So I wasn't going to go to New York, but I really want to go to when it opens. That latency of data that you're that, that pointing out is like, yeah, Myrtle Beach had opportunity and availability. They didn't close during COVID, as Stuart is very proud of. Um, you know, Tampa stayed open and now being close to a beachfront community, they're in constant demand. You know, I don't think they're in demand for the same reasons they were before. There is no real strong meeting usage right now. Um, it's growing back again because it's by the beach and it's a good solicitation of people to come and join stuff. But you know, I think those will be the first emerging convention related places to go to. I think Dallas for HSMAI and, and high tech is good because of centralization. Dallas in and September. September. In that, September, yes. Yeah, July point. is another thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. September you're right. and you're not in the Southeast because, I mean, you know, you're looking at a lot of variables to this. Dallas has always had a good sustainability through economies because of its centralization. It's you know, halfway between everywhere, you know, in that sense. And, and that centralization has proved very beneficial for it. Um, that said, I think it's a great middle point. Go ahead, Dean. Oh, so, but I, I want to go back to what you started with there because mm -hmm. you, you touched on something I thought was really important there. And that is that our comp set changes based on the stage of the marketing funnel. So at the top of my marketing funnel in the discovery phase, the prospecting phase, my comp set up here might be different then down here at the bottom of my marketing funnel, where now I'm at the direct response stage of it, right? Where mm -hmm. now we've decided on a destination. Okay, so you're you're changing your comp set all the way through that. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know, um, I also wanted to mention that Expedia has such a great tool for seeing, uh, it, and and as every single day, you can go into the back end, uh, the whatever it is. Uh, the center <laughs> and uh, and it'll tell you, oh, this hotel ate your lunch, this hotel ate your lunch, this hotel, uh, you know, ate your lunch, one after the other, you'll know exactly um, who 
who is who is taking a lot of your business mm -hmm. and who is is just getting it every so often it's it makes it so clear it's one of the reasons why uh people in sales and marketing and revenue have to work together because if only the revenue people are looking at the back end of Expedia you won't believe how how much information you can get from that that's, that's, that's a really great point yeah go ahead um, I want to go back to one of our, old, our previous guest co-hosts, Carrie um, uh, L with um, the Hotels Network. I was very interested in what they're proposing on this ability to share data. Um, uh, Bench Direct is what they called it, that you would put in tracking codes on your website and you were able to compare the data that um, um, your hotel was getting based on traffic to the website and, and so forth and so on. I was under the understanding that it was basically sharing web analytics. So one of my clients uh, decided they wanted to join this. And I thought, oh, this would be kind of fun to go over and see what it was. And I looked at the script code that they asked to be put onto the website. And it went into your e-com funnel as well. It was to track all of your transactions as well. And I had to pause. And I have to call Carrie back because I'm like, Carrie, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a big critic of platforms that uh, ask you to put on generalized scripting that track everything. I, I'm not a big fan of several platforms, nameless as they are, that take credit for a lot of stuff that they don't do, uh, simply because they intercede and hijack your attribution. And if Stuart was still in our conversation, attribution theft is real. Um, and they're doing the same thing. They're garnering a tremendous amount. Yes, Melissa, I agree with you, it's real. Um, you know, they're garnering a tremendous amount of information that you're offering. And just from a security perspective, in the process of them asking to send this on, they're all very happy and generous. And I'm not trying to be negative about this. I think it's a great idea to share data. But I don't agree to share conversion data. I don't agree to blanket script. I don't agree to whatever you want to take, go ahead and take it. Uh, there's security protocols that were not brought up into the put this on your website and tell us all this stuff. OK, I you know what like where, where, where what are you going to do with this data? How secure is this data? Who's going to see this data? All the 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 CCPA stuff, the GDPR stuff. You know, where is that addressed in this dialogue that says I put this script on my site? I put this script in my e-com funnel and now you have access to all the data that I have about my stuff. And. You say you're going to anonymize it and share it for general population. I understand that, but what are you doing with it? You know what, though, if you use if you use their services, their paid services, mm -hmm. you already have that script on, and you That's should true. because they are tracking how many people clicked on this and converted. That yeah. is not a new script. No, that is the same script. It's so true. I can tell um, how affected my my messages are if if the same message is placed here versus over mm -hmm. here, which is converting better. How it, it, I I I really want to see, for example, as somebody who has used their product for for years, uh, not recently, but when I was at uh, the Library Hotel Collection. I could see I could see when I missed a conversion what they were looking for and 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 can understand why that didn't convert because they were looking for a room for four people for example and mm -hmm. I didn't have that mm -hmm. um so it's it's as a paid relationship, you know, you I think they get a great platform. Yeah, you, you are using you are you are you are tracking your conversion right. somewhere, so mm -hmm. people already have that. So it's not anything new. In that's that sense, yes, saying. but it's a paid relationship that has a contract, and there's an obligation via the contract about security and data and things like this. There's nothing we sign to put this on the site. Are you are you sure that they're they're they don't have uh that they that you don't it, I think you have to agree to their terms and conditions which I is giving them the data yeah no no I, I went through the process with them and that's what I want to ask Carrie is like when when she was talking about it on the show and I, I love again going back to it, platform wise service wise product wise everything is 
great. I, I, I really am I'm a fanboy of what they're doing and what they offer services. To your point, all the usabilities of it are fantastic in that paid relationship with them. But the offering of data from a, a source that isn't paying them to run the system for them, that you're just providing the data, was really just an acknowledgement of accepting putting the code on for them to take the data and, and bring it over. There's, yeah. there's conversations about that it, what it's to be used for but there was no GDPA, GDPR kind of stuff as to what was being done. And that's why I'm asked with Kira is like, has this come up in dialogue? And, and this is not a negative conversation to them about it. I think the purpose of it and the value of it is everything we talked about. I think it, the ability to your point of saying, how is our market doing things? How are we seeing each other work in the market? How are we reacting to each other in the market? Are incredible insightful information. I just get concerned with general script tracking when all the data is available without a condition as to what all of it's being used for. That's my, but, that's my consideration. But you're not worried about it for those who have the initial product, the paid product. Well, but also when you, have, when you have the paid product, it has very specific purposes to go with it as well. Right. And, and I'm, sorry, this, I'm going to use a somewhat non compared example here, but I had a recent conversation with somebody that's running a meta search campaign. Meta search is very direct response. They click, they book, or they don't, right? So it's a, a very specific funnel that it goes through. And conversion pixels and all kinds of tracking ought to be involved in that because you mm -hmm. want to see what's going on. And a certain technology provider that was running a certain campaign for a certain client had difficulty tracking their conversions so I'm being as, as neutral as I can possibly be here. Uh, <laughs> and their solution, they said, was, well, we'll just put a script on your website, and that way we can track. And I'm like, whoa, hold it. You don't need to see all this other stuff. You need to see that specific line and that specific flow. You don't need everything else. So, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> you but know again, what? Also... Somebody should write an article about what you should, what scripts you should accept and and what oh, you we should. have i mean actually as we put it out there's five points of contracting negotiation requirements for confirmation care and clarification of conversion of, of contracts but the, the 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 difference is and I, again going back to the positives of these things is that a paid relationship there's a fiduciary responsibility of the of the vendor okay I, that's why i have insurance i have responsibilities of controlling the data security of the data who handles the data why do they have access to the data mm -hmm. so that the company that i have that access to knows that when it comes to their insurances and or assurances of security, they can look to me and say, he proved that he handles it this way. What I'm saying is from the initial process of going through this is we're offering a lot of data available for them to use. And they may be doing it for all the right reasons and all the right purposes to the, per you know, but there's no detail as to its security mm -hmm. that I've seen that they were offered. It's like, here's our data. And we hope, you know, you're going to use it to generally, you know, all of us get to understand the, the market and everything else like this. But the, I need to satisfy my insurance is that I'm not giving away access to confidential data that I say I can't validate. Like, OK, you're getting full script access to conversions. You know, this means confirmations and everything else. Where is it stored? Is it encrypted? Is it who has that? That was never really addressed in the dialogue. And that's why I want to get back with carry on. It's like, I love what you guys are doing. I really do. I think it's a great, insightful way for a market. I just want to make sure I understand how do I go to my insurance company or my legal teams and say, we're covered. They got this. This is what they do with it. This is how they secure it. I want to know if that's just something that only comes up in questions or is it something that I missed in the contract? But just it didn't happen until it happened where I just didn't know that they were going to be asking for commerce data. I thought mm -hmm. they were only worked about traffic data. So that was my bad for not understanding between the two. So, yeah, you know, I tried to go, come on, Carrie, uh, tell me who, which booking engine has the best conversions. Just tell me. <laughs> There's nothing you can <laughs> do. Is it behind the scenes? <laughs> right. You wouldn't tell? Yeah. I mean, you if you're, you know, you, I would be yeah. curious as to that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you would, yeah, you would want to know who that, yeah. And that's the fun part because, you know, uh, even with Ed, who's not here today, but his, his flip two and what they're doing for all their tracking and so forth, the omnipotency of understanding macro motions and markets is very powerful. You know, the trends, the interest. I, you know, to your point, going back earlier, where I was saying that the difference between the New York comparison you had and the Myrtle Beach was the latency of data. Well, you know, we, even when we go to Google Trends, we're dealing with latency of data. I mean, it's a wonderful yeah. tool. It's a free tool. But the real data is 
going to your own website and only having a latency of 24 hours. Well, you have you to know. have the context that goes with it too. Because like you said, New York was closed. Myrtle Beach was open. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't put that context into the data, it's not a proper comparison. True. But, you know, that being said, from a marketing, going back to where we're talking about comp sets and so forth, you, you, I think you made a very clear point to it from the, our dialogue was there's a strata of conversations that get to the point of your comparative comp set analysis when you get to that level of discussion that warrants business A versus business C versus business D. You know, up to that point, it's about market A, market B, market D. And demographics A, demographics B. Demo I mean, there's different layers of how you compare yourself to what your your business yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I don't think anybody really has done well. I'll be fair. Uh, and this is why I think Carrie is doing wonderful because she's addressing it. And that is looking at the market influence, not necessarily the implied comp influence of what you're doing. Uh, to, to, you know, you're looking at data that can give you analysis of trend and, and intent and things that don't normally show in RevPAR and ADR and occupancy. Those are those are conversion values. They're not trend values. And so there is a need for that upper level um, perspective that has to come in. And a lot of people aren't very skilled at knowing where where they can draw data in. I mean, a lot of people don't even know about Google Trends, and that's one of the more basic generalized data sources that you can get, you know, just overall trends of comparisons of people's interest in market and what are they looking for in comparison to other markets and what time of year and historically what, I mean, what are the peak periods and so forth, which you be kind of careful with that thing. Cause you can really go down a rabbit hole and start getting impressed with it. And two hours later, you're like, Oh crap. <laughs> yeah. 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 It gets, and, and, and also too, you can go with any data, the first wrong step, is the longest painful step because you have to retrace back to where you made the wrong mistake of, of an implied value. Uh, a lot of times I, I find that most people have two perspectives when they approach the data, verification of their, their, their idea or denial of their idea. And the latter one is the, free, is the, it's the least likely. Most people look for verification of their process. I have, this is what I think is happening. And they look for data that verifies it. Managers do the same thing. Oh, uh, you know, they ignore everybody that doesn't agree with them. And the one person that does, hey, he's got it. He's He knows what he's talking about. What? Nine people told you you're whacked. <laughs> <laughs> this one guy thinks that you're not whacked because he's kissing your butt. Okay. He's right. You know, and, and people do that with data. People go over and it's like, I know this is what I think it is. And I'm going to find any data that supports it. And they ignore anything that doesn't support it. And, and really, um, the best way I found is that when you have an idea shoot at it all day long. If it, after you give it your best effort to prove it wrong, it still holds water. It might just be the right answer. You know, um, it, it's, it's, it, 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 data's like that, I think in that sense too. So anyways, you need to compare bookings in the same market against the same property types to get a fair comparison. Confirmation yeah, just talking property. about the, uh, who had yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks yeah. Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Confirmation bias is also real. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, you know, uh, what, what, what's the old joke? 86% of the st statistics are made up on the spot. You know, it's like yeah, right. anybody can make statistics look the way they want them to by ignoring the data that doesn't support it. Just like the time, I think I told you about it a week or two ago, where I saw on the internet that hotels with 3.5 uh, stars make an average of 600,000 while um, hotels with five stars make an average of 500,000. And like, I mean, how could anybody look at that and think that they're looking at anything that's rooted in any kind of reality? That's who compares a hotel by, who compares a hotel that way about, you could be comparing a, a thousand room hotel that with three and a half stars by with a 50 room hotel with um, with five stars. It just statistics are crazy. You, you, you have to really look at how they got those figures. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and you're right. It's like, it's, it's like with anything when even in advertisement and marketing where somebody says we're voted number one by mm -hmm. who your mom, 
by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as long as you can make one statement that you say, yes, this one person voted us number one on, you know, unless you you show where was I voted, how was it announced, you know, and, and it's unfortunately the skepticism has come bred from us as marketers having distorted those kind of statements as validations of marketing rather than validations of truth. You know, uh, us saying things like that in our marketing strategies with the little asterisk and the little super fine print yeah. and everything else that you know, get in there, you know, uh, just like these auto dealerships. Hey, you can buy a car with only a dime down. Really? How's that <laughs> going to work? You know, and yet people, oh, my gosh, I don't need a dime and I got to buy me a car, you know, and it's like, nope, doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, I love the roadside attractions that you're driving by and it's that uh, Highway 51's best hamburger. OK, according to who? Doesn't matter. Are you the only one serving a hamburger? Right now, know? it's the best hamburger, and I'm hungry. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah. And, and that's and that's where a lot of uh, I, I really feel like media has a value proposition of authentication or denial by going through these processes. You know, it, it was funny that you know uh, Food Channel with Guy Ferrari and, and Diners, Drivers, and Dives as an example really created the this this unique genre that's always been there but never truly defined on the uniqueness of things and the value of it to those people that find it valuable not that that is the number one burger joint in the world which was always the criteria before oh what is the best of the best and that's the only thing we feature instead it's highlighting the uniqueness of what people find about it just for those people it's just hey look this is a local joint it's been around for 50 years everybody loves coming here it's biscuits and gravy Probably the same biscuits and gravy you get in a thousand other places, but you know what? We're going to feature this place because it's got a cool story. It's been around for 50 years. Mm -hmm. You revel in the uniqueness of whatever that particular thing is. And I don't think hotels have really adopted that perspective yet of, and, and some hotels maybe can't, you know, uh, if you're a box vanilla brand on the side of a road somewhere, it's really going to be hard to be the, you, you got to come here other than value proposition of, of, of why it's there. But the other places that have a story to tell, we're getting into the with the place now where we have the media capabilities. We can watch any video we want on a phone. Remember when you had to download that thing on a computer and you had to wait a couple hours, you know, after you did the dial-up connection and you had to wait for it to actually download before you could see whatever the heck it was? Videos weren't really shared a lot. You know, images weren't even really shared a lot because it just was an inconvenience to try to see them and forget about it on your phone. Your phone didn't even freaking, you know, in, 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 if you were only on Wi-Fi, maybe, uh, you know, yeah. now everything we're watching everything on anything, you know, and we really haven't risen to that challenge yet where our media hasn't followed up. And I don't know whether you guys get on YouTube or not, but I am just absolutely up to here with YouTube ads. And either they're reminding me that I should buy the premium version of YouTube so I don't have to deal wow. with the ads, or I got to go through any video that I want to see on YouTube, four or five ads, and then they do this really sneaky, nasty thing I will never do in my ads. Leave your ad up until you click it off. It's it's okay. So the first video plays where it, 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 there's mandated video. You have to watch the full video before the video begins that you want to watch. Then there is the video playing that it has a countdown before you can skip it. Right. Then there's the ones that come up, and Facebook's been doing this, been driving me nuts too. The video will play. You have to watch that video. The second video plays, and you have no means to skip it until it's done. So and then we'll, it'll yeah. still stay there until you hit skip. And it will be the only thing that's on your screen until you tell it to turn it off. So it's and a static screen at that point. Static screen. And That's it just nice. drives, it just like, wow, is that a big, to the point where now all of what we're doing with the show and so forth in particular and the TV channel stuff they're doing and everything is on my own video service. I'm, I'm, I'm putting it on YouTube for distribution. That's fine. But everything that we use is on an encrypted server video that will not be interrupted with crap like that. Where as it runs on YouTube now, some of our, our shows, it'll pop in and it'll be an ad because you know, I turned it off, but it's like, so no, I don't want this kind of stuff on there. And of course you get penalized because then YouTube will not show you as much because you're not allowing ads to be placed on it. So there's a give and take. If you want your distribution, you got to let them put ads on. 
And when we get certain viewerships on some of our previous shows, all of a sudden ads start popping up, little bottom, bottom banners. Fortunately, you know, it's not, we're crazy where they start doing these video interruptions yet, but if as we grow in an audience on, the, on YouTube, that's gonna happen. So it's just, it's an annoying component of all this process. You know, um, just of a thing, so yes, uh, Robert, thank you, Robert, for doing this. He sent out the thing. I, I really locked in on one um, article he put out that bothered me. And I just wanted you guys, is it Hilton saying that other than the, and he referred to it in his dialogue, unless you're one of the top brand Hiltons, housekeeping is a thing of demand only at this point. I didn't read the full article to know if that was truly uh reality for them? I mean, is that true that the low, the, the non-premium uh, brands of Hilton are not going to allow or not are just going to do uh, housekeeping on demand? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now here. Can you, yeah. Drop it into the notes here real quick. Yeah. You know, as long as as long as you're giving the guests what they want, as, as long as you're not denying service to somebody who wants it, What's the problem with that? They clean the room before you get there and, and after you leave and as many times during the process as possible. I do think, though, that there might be something in between those two of just saying, you know, do you want a full refresh of the room or do you want us to just come and remove the garbage and give you fresh towels? I'd be happy with that. I would be happy with that as well. And uh, because I am disgusted at the hundreds of pictures that I've seen of really messed up rooms at the end of a stay because nobody's been taking the trash out. Yeah, take out my trash, give me clean towels. I, I don't need you to make my bed every day. Me neither. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We react to it. I reacted it differently than you guys did. That's fine. Hey, oh, I see your logic and I see your perspective. And maybe it's just me and my mood this week, I guess. I, I see this as a reflection of what we tried to do with the green movement of, oh, um, your towels. And at first it sounded like, oh, you're trying to be more uh, environmentally friendly. No, I'm cost saving. I'm just saving right. the laundry bill, okay? We, we were eco-friendly, yeah. But right. you know <laughs> what? Yeah. It's, it is... It, it is saving the environment, so why why not? I mean, it is still need to wash the, ta uh, the the sheets and towels and remake it every single day. That's what we used to do, and it is kind of silly. But are you doing saying, it to be eco-friendly, or are you doing it because you're cheap? <laughs> you know what? The customer is making that choice because they want to be eco-friendly, but, it just so happens to also be a benefit for you. But the backlash to that was, and I know people that did this, and I'm not that I agree with them, but they, they're like, I, if I'm paying this for this room, I'm freaking throwing every towel on the floor I can. I don't care. So you know, do it. That's, what, that's know, what they're doing. Right. That's and, that you you have that option. If if Hilton is saying they'll still clean, get, give a full cleaning to the room if you want it, when you want it. I didn't say anything about pricing wise, because here's the other thing that I would, I would push back on from the negative perspective, which is where I'm coming from, is that um, does that lower my price that you're not going to be doing housekeeping like you used to? Yeah, they, they could say that they could say that it does. Uh, how would you tell the difference if you haven't been tracking rates for that particular hotel for the last three months? How would you know that? Oh, gosh, now that, you know, yeah, I got it. So they could say it does. Yeah, I mean, do you, do, do, do you, and, and also too, do you create a logistics nightmare by saying, hey, we'll give you $20 off if you don't want to do daily housekeeping, but then you have to have internal logistics of which rooms paid versus which didn't, where Mr. Smith calls him and says, hey, my room isn't cleaning. Going, yeah, Mr. Smith, you didn't pay for a daily cleaning. You don't want that. You don't want any of that stuff. So it's like, I, I do, and I appreciate the fact you're seeing it from a positive perspective, because I need to see things from a positive perspective a little bit more this week, um, that, hey, look, we're, you know, and it does answer the things that people are already publicly aware of that we have a labor shortage. And so we are finding ways to organize ourselves that we'd have less demand responsibilities for staff. Um, and to your point, there are some things that if I could just get those things, I'd be okay, like trash. And or, you know, is there enough, another modality? Do I put the stuff up by the front door? And if so, do I want people going down the hallway with a bag of trash out somebody's door? I mean, how do you facilitate some of the 
I think there's a, some middle grounds to your point, Adele, that that can be done. That uh, you know, just like when you used to walk down the hallway and there was room service trays, and the worst thing you ever noticed is that six hours later you walk back there and the same dang room service tray is sitting out in front of somebody's room, going, "Dude, depends on the hotel. Yeah, it depends on the hotel, and yeah. your your security cameras will point out where those where those trays are. So it's <laughs> it can be really helpful, go. but um. You know what? I mean, I've I've spent a lot of time living in hotels, and and if I'm going to stay for two months, for example, at a hotel, just show me where the garbage goes, and I mm. take it out myself, and I will I will watch for the the lady with the cart, and, and I will I will grab those uh, towels and trade her for towels when I need to, and I've been perfectly happy like one. And we also have some infrastructures. I know from, again, my Canadian clients is that they've already had to build infrastructures on quarantining and so forth that they've implemented. There is a methodology modality as to how they facilitate rooms that people are under quarantine. So we have some SOPs in process for some hotels that handle this, this dialogue between room and service. Like this is your towels, this is your trash bags, this is your whatever. Uh, but then you throw in things like, uh, was it MGM or I forget who it was in Vegas is look, talking to Grubhub to replace their room service with Grubhub service. Hmm. Well, like, you know what? I okay. mean, it's such a money losing proposition. And you know what? Because fewer people want um, to, to eat in their rooms anyway, but they want that option. So you make it more expensive. You've got you know, 20% gratuity and a 5% service fee and a this and that and the other thing. There are so many fees on it that you're paying $75 for a hamburger with fries and a Coke. It's mm -hmm. just insanity. It's, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So why not look for another opportunity that will fill the need of the guest? Maybe even better than room service because they'll have a lot more options and uh, and not be such a money losing proposition for the hotel. You know, um, also I think I that we're 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 a little bit less flexible because you know we've experienced you know decades of hospitality service uh, the th the way things used to be, and so our expectations are a little bit different. But the younger people coming in. They are, you know, they're setting the standards for themselves of what they want. And they care a lot more about having unique experiences, which might be accomplished better from Grubhub. <laughs> and and uh, and they care a lot more about the ecology and just try to ask a Canadian about uh, having a hotel that doesn't have the the ecology protocols. Well, has really you given know. rise to a lot of companies like a Grub. Grubhub is a great example. Grubhub has been around for a long time. I don't know if most mm -hmm. people realize this. I Back in 2009, I, I was in reputation management working with a program called Review Analyst, and we were pulling in restaurant reviews, and we pulled in Grubhub had reviews on their site. That was 2009, so that's 10, 12, or 10, 11 years ago that Grubhub was around, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody heard of them until last year, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when all of a sudden because of COVID and so forth. So, you know, it, yeah, you're right, absolutely right, Adil. It has changed the dynamic. It's changed the way that we think. Maybe not the way that we think, but that younger generation that's traveling, they're like, yeah, sure, I'll do Grubhub. It's not It's not even a thing. It's no, just like uh, getting an Uber. It used to be that we got a taxi, then we all changed and got an Uber, and now that's the norm. And say so it's no longer the exception. Yeah, you know, the library hotel collection owner uh, felt mm -hmm. as a mature person that this is not the standard of luxury to say that we're not going to, you know, clean your room every day. We're not going to have that kind of thing. We're not going to talk about um, that we won't change your towels that are hanging on the thing because I don't want anybody to think we're we're um, nickel and diming. Uh, the guests. We want to give them the full experience. Uh, but we actually did have people complain. Well, what's wrong with you people? Why don't you know this? We're in the 21st century and we, we want to have those uh, ecological protocols in place. 
uh, it's different that they consider that something that's missing in our service. I think, unfortunately, I don't want to be the hair bringer, but I'm being negative, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I am being, yeah. Um, and that is, is that uh, I think we're going to create two different ships in hospitality. There is the efficiency ship, which is where we're tending to go with most of the hotels, which is uh, kiosk driven, uh, third party grub hubby, uh, 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 housekeeping on demand, uh, functionality, I just need a space mentality stuff. And be, to address the labor shortages and the need for service efficiencies and what have you. And then we're gonna create a, I wouldn't say elite, but a uh, scale up where bellhops exist and concierge desks exist and uh, daily engagement exists and uh, uh, internalization of food and beverage and spas and things, the destination component. And it's going to be expensive to do uh, to go there. Uh, it, it's going to be aspirational for some and, and, the, and the baseline for others. But there is going to be this, this and not that we haven't already had it in some existences because we had Holiday Inn Express. As soon as Holiday Inn Express came into our world, the hotels changed because it was offering efficiency of service rather than the experience of service. That's mm -hmm. my personal perspective. Um, but I think it's going to get a larger riff now. I think we're going to, for means of the fact that we don't have the labor resources that we used to enjoy uh, and, and the cost of labor that will have to obviously be reflected in future tense, we're going to have a, a larger polarization, I think, in the hospitality service profile. There are those hotels like library collection, things that will offer that 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 feel, that 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 goodness of being there, the attentiveness and so forth. And not that staff members at restricted services or limited services wouldn't be trying to do good service. It's just, they're gonna be multitasking. They're not gonna be serving you your food. They're not gonna be serving you your housekeeping. They're gonna be serving the functionalities that you need them interacted with at a, a combined level. And uh, I think we're gonna create more polarization, which is also creating, I think, opportunities for the Airbnbs, VRBOs and places of the world to be able to be compared against saying, since you're already doing most of the stuff yourself and or things aren't being done for you, why not stay here? That way you can have a little bit more engagement of what you would like on private space, perhaps, or whatever. I think there'd be more of a comparison that gets created out of that. I'm not saying they're going to take massive share, but they already have taken share. They didn't exist 20 years ago, and now they do. So... Anyway. Well, right, technology does change the way that we do things. Kiosks are a really good example. But think, for example, when was the last time you wrote a check? physically wrote a check. And and let's even say that you wrote a check recently. When was the last time you mailed a check hmm. and, and paid a bill by mailing a check? No, you we use online banking now, right? Use your ATM card. You we don't do it. So you know things change. Things become and more efficient. My parents still write checks. My, so 86. does my mom. <laughs> uh -huh. My yeah. mom is 79 years old though. So <laughs> And, and they do have, you know, and you're right. And, and yes, technology will be changing. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those early bleed adopters of things and, you know, not everything works out. I have a, I have a graveyard of softwares that I bought or have used or had or apps that I've had, you know, that don't work exist anymore or have been bought and merged and consolidated or simply abandoned, you know. Uh, and, and yes, it's, it's the bane of when you you're early adopter, you're taking on things that seem promising, but they morph into something that didn't succeed and or was absorbed by something else. Uh, I think uh, our industry, it will be fun this September to consider what gets presented to our industry as technology. Because uh, to our earlier discussion today about what are technology things that you should be considering, the Wi-Fi's of the world, the environmental HVAC stuff of the world and so forth. How much is that going to play a part in the technology displays of high tech? You know, is it all going to be about software? Because for a while, these past years prior to COVID, it turned into a software palooza. I mean, very little hardware was truly represented as much as it used to be. And I mean, going back to the old days when there was rows of housekeeping hmm. equipment. And house I'm going to disagree with you there. Okay, go ahead. So I'm, I'm going to disagree because I can remember back in the days of Utel and Pegasus when right. when they were in, in Synexus, when they were the big CR, well, they still have Synexus, is, the, the CRS world where the software companies are the ones that had the double decker mm -hmm. booths and things going on and as years went by those got smaller and the hardware the tv the cable companies all of those but things they went away the but they went away 
TVs went away. The, the, the centralization of hardware for cable. Because I remember those, you know, you're right. There was rows of TV services, you know. Yes. Uh, you know, where and there was rows of housekeeping. There was rows of uh, delivery. To, I mean, trucks and buses and things, you know, from, from door, a- And a, door locks were a big thing. Door locks and card creators and ID creators yeah. and, and all this other stuff that was hardware. And I'm not saying that's gone away, gone away, because there's always rows of those in some capacity. But the, the volume of it in comparison to the other volume- Software seemed, you know, revenue management software. Remember the, the years where revenue management software was the buzz? Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, probably when Ed was sitting around in in, uh, in his company's booth or something. Um, Easy well, Yield. Easy Yield. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all those other ones. Uh, I, but software seems to become the dominant dialogue on a lot of things. You think it's gone uh, back to that? Okay. Yeah. Which yeah. now I'm sitting here thinking to myself, when was the last time I was at a high tech? And come to think of it, it's been a while. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, two years. Well, two years ago was my last one. Um, okay. And 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 there was some really neat emerging softwares. I always love going to the high numbered rows, the ones that were they paid their last dime to get the ten foot table. They don't have much in this way of display. Yeah. Like this is their this is their shot at fame that they showed up at high tech because high tech's expensive to produce. Yes. Right Very expensive, and you know there's a lot of uh, methodologies to, as to how you get placed, where you get placed, and what priority you get placed, and all this other stuff. And yes, but I also remember back in Dean, that's probably the same time you're referring to, Microsoft was a dominant player. They had, one year they had this monster two rows by half the depth uh, pavilion thing, you know, and and uh, there, there's always been the players that come in and make a big splash and then didn't find the value to stay there the next year or something. Um, it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting to see what comes up. I'm also going to be very interested to see how Rock works for uh, HSMAI. It's like... Mm -hmm. What is going to be the focus of dialogue? You know, uh, we keep talking about it on the show about data combinations between pre-COVID, COVID, post, well, not post-COVID, but emergence. Uh, how does that all work? And there's been a lot of conversation we've been brought up on the shows and Clubhouse as well as to this perception of revenue managers' role as to whether they even work below ownership anymore. They just stay at the ownership level, that they're a resource of ownership only because their dialogue seems to be more tailored to investment value and revenue generation strategy to the owner than they are to the hotel. The hotel basically is the recipient of their decisions, not an influencer of them as much. And I don't agree with it. I'm just saying that that has come up in dialogue. Well, and, and, and along with that, so you've got the rock conference and you have the marketing conference and how much bleed over is there between the two? Because revenue optimization and marketing really now have to go hand in hand. Your reservations manager is probably also doing something with the digital marketing. Mm -hmm. it, it all, I mean, they always should have gone hand in hand. You're absolutely right. <laughs> okay. yeah, it should have always been converged. Uh, yeah. And I think that the reason that they're coming together and the reason that they're saying it's a commercial strategy conference is that their uh, HSMAI is trying to say, we should be experts in sales, marketing, and revenue together. I, like I mean, we should said. not be biased. Commercial strategy conference. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they'll rename the whole thing and just call it that. Well, that that, that they they are saying that the marketing uh, the marketing conference is yeah. an HSMAI commercial strategy conference, and the same thing about Rock, and the same thing about the sales, even okay. though. You know, some people will say that, oh, the salespeople should be left alone. But you know what? They're mm -hmm. going to make sales calls on people and they're going to go back and, and they're going to look at the marketing. The marketing is going to go with it. The, the, the revenue strategy is going to go with it. There, there's no leaving the sales manager out of the equation. Mm -hmm. They're getting feedback from the customer about what they need and what they want and how they're making decisions. How can you separate them from that? And by the way, I say there's a fourth part that HSMAI in Europe acknowledges, which is people and culture. And the, the Americas doesn't have that, although Rob, Rob Gilbert will say, uh, well, that's what the HSMAI foundation is. It's about the training and the leadership and everything. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be really separate 
Well, I'd, I'd even expand, and this has been a conversation I've had in presentations where operations in fragmentation of not just operations, logistics as to the fulfillment of what's being provided by marketing, sales, and revenue management, but also HR for getting the proper team members involved, accounting yes. for the proper methodologies of tracking the revenues, because here's where gap points come through. A contract gets signed for, and we just had this conversation at the very beginning, Dean, of, of commission-based relationship with some entity. And so accounting gets handed this contract. Pay these people when they send you an invoice. Okay. And so they get an invoice from these third parties that are commission-based models. And accounting does this due diligence. Okay, I got a bill. Here's the bill. Nobody goes back and says, let's wait a minute here. What is it they're billing us for in comparison to the contract that we have with them? Oh, wait a minute. These bookings that they say we have to pay commission on came through a group block. Why are we paying them for what we have as a negotiated group lock just because they said they touched their system and so attribution wise they are obligated or we're obligated to pay them? No, we don't pay on our group blocks for people that are booking if they happen to trigger your system. So county has to be aware, the point I'm making is county has to be aware of its responsibilities associated with what it pays for by understanding the contract that we've negotiated in. And that comes from a dialogue. That comes from the collaboration you keep referring to, Adele, that we're all working together mentality. And then HR, they sit and they, they need to be brought into a lot more conversations with marketing in particular, especially with the current labor environment. They have to polish up their marketing skills. I am unfortunately seeing so many job postings that are what we want, what we need, what we expect, what we demand, what we think, with no dialogue about what we offer, what our culture is, what do we want you to be able to attain with us? How is it that we can offer you what it is you're looking for? There's no two-way dialogue in that process because they've never had to deal with it in that context before. And so they need to be working with the departments as to exactly what they need as a team member to tailor that in the terms that they need to get and solicit the people that the team needs. Because as we say, oftentimes, you, know, you put toxic people into a relationship just because they fulfill a criteria and they fail, there's nobody that they blame. They don't blame HR. HR say, hey, I took the, the list that you told me that they had to have, three years experience, five years education, blah, 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 and this qualified and you hired them. And meanwhile, yeah. the, the other people are going over going, but the guy was a dork, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first of all, go, going back a little bit in in boutique hotels, I can tell you for sure the sales and marketing uh, director is going through every mm. single reservation, you know, to see is that a corporate client, is that a group, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. that whatever it is. Did they even stay? You know, was it a dupe? Whatever it is. Mm. Um, and sometimes people canceled or whatever. Uh, but number two, regarding the, the people and the culture, um, a lot of a lot of companies do talk about the people and the culture. It's just that what they say isn't actually a representation of real life. And Good point. so Good point. it's Good and point. Yeah, and it, uh, it 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 wasn't me that made that point, but recently I heard um, Dr. Peter Ritchie from uh, FAU, who uh, he you know he did a, like a survey or or got a lot of feedback from eighty something thousand students who were either at the school or taking some sort of cert certification. You know that he got a Hospitality Hero Award and the one of the top 25 minds in, uh, in, in the marketing from HSMAI. And because they opened up that complimentary uh, education for a lot of people during, uh, during COVID. And so he got a lot of feedback about where people are now and the experience that they're having in the industry. And he says, you know, a lot of it is window dressing that doesn't have any bones and, 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 uh, behind it. And it's a sad situation because I always refer back to Gandhi <laughs> who said, happiness is when what we think and what we say and what we do are in harmony. And right now those, those there's a, such a big gap between what we're, what the executive office thinks, what the marketing department says and what. Oh yeah. Is oh yeah. 
And and then that's bred into our industry based on the fact that we have the multiplicities, the multi-headed beast, so to speak, of ownership's perspective, management teams, pers management services perspective, brands perspective, properties perspective. Uh, and, and to your point exactly, if they're not in harmony, if they're not all working towards the same thing, there's this divergence of, of, method, of methodologies. You know, you can't take an ownership that is revenue driven and bring that into a management company whose obligation is to the ownership, but is service driven to a property that has to answer to two different masters while the brand is saying that there's brand prerogatives that they have to maintain as well. That is in divergence of the other two. You just, you can't solve all, all the, all the demands of it. And property is usually the one left in the middle trying to sort through who happens to be the, the priority of the day is the <laughs> ownership. All of a sudden the adamant, you know, desk beating mandate that says, we're not going to hire that role because it cost me too much or I don't need it yet, or you can't justify it, or the marketing budget that's not approved because I don't see the revenue of return when really you're building brand awareness and it's not about ROIs, it is about market voice that brings further revenue. And you know, there's there's so many daily conversations that these things, you just hit around the head, of that that lack of harmony that exists. And, and, and yes, marketing definitely blows smoke. You know, uh, that um, to the unfulfillment of the reality of the, the thing. I've seen toxic corporate environment that outside looks sunshine okay. and rainbows. Absolutely. So, yeah. so have oh, I. I've been in it. I actually feel like uh, I had battered wife syndrome from hmm. one of the, my, my past experiences. Hmm. And uh, it, it was, it was unbelievable how limited my, my thinking was when I was in that environment. Mm -hmm. And then when I changed my environment, you know, I, 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 I had a voice and, and I could get amazing things accomplished. The same mm -hmm. person with mm -hmm. the right environment. I, I can is, tell if, no, I can't tell it, it is interesting to explore different cultures and, and different environments, like you said, like that too. Uh, internationally, domestically, whatever the case may be. But, you know, we've all worked with different companies that had different styles. It doesn't mean that one style was necessarily right versus wrong over the other, but they were different, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I will take my own example, actually, is I just I recently started doing some work uh, with a company and the, the founder of the company is a surfer. And he's got the whole surfer mentality and all that thing going on. I've never been in a company like that before. I've never done yeah. that before. Uh, and it's a great company, but it's very it's very different for me, but in a good way. I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool, you know? So, you know, try different things. Yeah, you, you, mm. you may not have done it before. It may not be what you're used to, but try something new. It, it's, it's, it's a shame because we look to politics in some ways as a reflection of how we do business. And unfortunately, when the decision process within corporate, it, it's, it turns political where how many times are we supporting each other and what capacities to know whether my agenda gets pushed versus your agenda gets pushed and whether I have to consider, you know, give consider considerations to you that I'm not totally happy with, but by doing so, you're supporting something that I do need pushed. And all these mixings of things that happen, sandboxes of this is my department, not your department, you know, mentalities that if taking your advice, Adele, if everything was in harmony, it doesn't make a difference as to whom get, I honestly, I've, I've had a statement I've lived with my whole life. If you don't care who gets the credit, anything is possible. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, if, absolutely. if you just worry about the end solution and not about who brought it to the finish line, honestly, it's amazing what you can get done. Mm -hmm. And if you keep acknowledging everybody that participated, whether they had a strong role or a minor role or no role, but they were on the team when you did it, that is more worth than anything else. And HR has not stood up to that as much as I think they should as our industry. I don't think HR has turned into the champion that it should be for those people. And I think we're in an education phase for our industry where I, I saw a post on Facebook, which made me mad, made me kind of like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it made the statement that if you were bit, you know, complaining that uh, somebody that made $2 and 13 cents an hour about uh, they should get another job if they don't like it, are now bitching about the fact that you're not getting service at your restaurant, who's hypocritical now? You know, it's, we got what we paid for. Sorry. You know, we, we basically told people, this is the price that we pay. If you don't like it, go find something else. Well, guess what they did. Yeah. And now, and now we're in a position where if we want 
to be provide, you know, the need for those positions to be filled, we have to compensate them at the level that's required. I, I noticed something bizarre. Biden went over and did something where he made it where uh, first responders all get fifteen dollars an hour. I didn't even know they didn't get paid fifteen dollars an hour. I was first like, what? You mean like a f- firefighter? Yeah. Yes. Officers? There yeah. was some yeah. sort of thing that got passed yeah. politically that, that 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 just said that there's a minimum uh, uh, per per hour fifteen dollars or something. We're like, what? Wait a minute, they don't get paid what? Yeah. I don't know whether that was just a baseline for people, and obviously some people got paid more, but others didn't. I didn't know there was even a thing like that. Uh, we often take for granted we don't always know all the moving pieces to stuff, and I don't think people often understand that. There are some people that do get paid very well. Uh, CEOs get paid way more than they ever should. Um, but, but the people that are doing the heavy work may not be getting at a level of compensation for the workload that they're doing either. Um, it's, I, think, I think HR has to become more than just the corporate champion, which really that's what they are. They're there to, to ensure the security and safety of the company's interests and not so much the individuals. They follow protocols and SOPs and processes. They make sure that they follow governmental guidelines and rules and regulations. That isn't about the benefit of the individual employee sometimes. That's about the benefit of the corporate structure. And they need to be about more balanced act. They have to be more of a vanguard. I think some companies from a service profile have done very well when they create a champion for their clients, uh, where that person is a solicitor for the client's interest, even though they're being paid by the company, but they're soliciting the client in their service. Uh, that's what I think a salesperson does. From the way you describe it, how you always see things, Adele, I think that the salesperson is the advocate of the client. They're there to get the best for what the client wants in deference to what company is willing to not sacrifice to do it. Like the company is always looking at cost savings and efficiencies and what's the minimum we have to do to fulfill what they're interested in. And the salesperson is like, don't do that to them. Put the big bouquet, not the little bouquet. Look, you know, the, the, you know, this, the, you know, they're the ones that keep pushing. They're the advocates of it. Yeah. That, that's the advantage that all of us on this call here, all of us on this uh, show, have an advantage of as consultants is that we can be platform agnostic consultants. In other words, we can look at you, look at what you're doing, and objectively say, you know, that one's wrong for you. This one might be right for you, and not have any bias towards that because right. we don't work for the company. <laughs> anyway, I'm just really uh, happy that I feel starting back when the marketing conference for HS May, I was about convergence, and now we have mm-hmm. this commercial strategy theme running between sales, marketing, and revenue. I think that that is moving in the right direction Mm -hmm. for our industry as a whole, where we will have much more crossover. I think that the revenue people are realizing that they have a possibility of having a voice in so much more and learning so much more about the entire operation, not just setting prices, but actually generating demand, you know, Mm -hmm. looking how to generate demand in partnership with sales and marketing and not against them. So I, I think that that's all good. And I just think we're just missing that one point, which I, I just actually took the certification course for, um, they call it, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly, excellence in customer centricity uh, at HSMAI Europe. And uh, and they have a people and culture, not just sales, marketing, and revenue, but sales, marketing, revenue, and people and culture. And mm-hmm. I hope we're going in that direction. Everybody should be thinking like that because if you care about your revenue, if you care about your sales, if you care about your ROI and your marketing, You've got to be caring about the guest experience and what your customers are saying about you. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's just me. I think is an interesting juxtaposition in future. It, it's, it, it can be the voice that it's supposed to be for our industry, for this mindset. By the same token, it has to validate its value at a time when people have the least amount of time to focus on it. Mm-hmm. You know, right now for those people that are in need of what it can offer, they have the least amount of time to actually spend learning what they need to learn because they're just crazy taking care of their logistics on a daily basis. But they truly need that that vision, that long view kind of thing, and that what should be thought about now going towards it. 
And so it just made, I think, is an interesting, I wouldn't say rebirth. I just say a redevelopment of its value proposition now that the industry is coming back into its business model. Uh, and I really am looking forward to seeing how HSMAI does this blending of its marketing, blending of its rock. Uh, they did start a sales conference before COVID uh, and, and how that gets brought into the conversation and how it begins to scale itself. Uh, how does it become a player? I think EU, I think uh, 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 they've done a phenomenal job. I think Jackie in the APAC has done a great job with training. I mean, she's been really the vanguard of training in APAC because that's a very value proposition to it. And talk about a different market, APAC, gosh, that's a different world for hospitality. But anyways, um, we're, we, yeah, we're there. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, Robert, thank you for sending your list. If you're listening to this at the tail end of the show for this, there are, of course, if you want to get the newsletter that we referred to that he joined uh, with us lately, you can go to uh, bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash rock cheetah, all lowercase, no space. There's the newsletter that he puts out, um, whether it makes it before the show or not, or we get it in the middle of the show, it's always a question mark to it. Um, but uh, it, it's great content for that. With that in mind, uh, thank you both, as always, uh, taking the time today. I know it's going into a holiday weekend. Um, it's it's kind of interesting to think um, how the world, this is probably going to be what they said, 48 million people traveling in the U.S. alone, 3 million. Wow. Yeah, that's a boatload of people. Uh, and so it should be interesting to see where everybody's mindset is now that we've passed this benchmark going into summer as to what people's future plan strategies are. Uh, and then also as that transitions into fall, uh, whether we our market shifts change, change or not. So anyways, um, Adele, for those who want to know about you and where to find you, where is it they can go? You find me uh, on the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast. Get great reviews. And uh, you can visit AdeleGutman.com. That's where you're going to find the podcast in the audio form and uh, blog posts and YouTube videos. And if you are getting mixed reviews, those, those negative and even just the neutral reviews are... Are, are preventing you from reaching your full potential in revenue. And uh, and I would be very happy to help you turn that around to give you a reputation renovation and uh, optimize optimize your full potential. So uh, contact me for, uh, via AdeleGutman.com. Mr. Dean with the very <laughs> cool spiffy shirt. Where is it they can find you, sir? Dean at BasecampMeta.com. So Basecamp Meta. Finding your way if you want to learn about MetaSearch, metasearchmarketing.com, plugging you in if you just need somebody to run the bloody thing for you. Uh, we can go both directions with that. Uh, recently partnered with HSMEI, we do have an on-demand education uh, course about MetaSearch. So uh, if, you, if you don't know how you have time to do it, uh, go on there and you can do it at your convenience. You got a long holiday weekend coming up. Why not, as you're sitting there sipping your cocktail on Monday, uh, go there and and do that because yeah, just get drunk and do that at the same time. <laughs> it makes so much more sense when you get a buzz. It does. <laughs> like, oh my god, this is the universe explained. Uh, hey, yes, I tell you those. I I got to say something with with respect to MetaSearch. You know, for a long time, I've run MetaSearch campaigns. I did. I ran it for Wyndham and run different companies. And I've worked with a lot of the standard uh, operating systems that are out there. The software, the the Nexuses of the world, and different things like that. Right, and. Even for me, it actually has kind of um, uh, been a little bit of a surprise as some recent clients that I've started working with at how difficult connectivity is with some of these systems. And it, it just kind of, we're in 2021, guys, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so if you need help navigating and, and getting around that and figuring that out, let me know. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we uh, the show has a new home. We've migrated pretty much two years worth of shows. We have another five to add over to it, so it's a process. Um, and that is over at hospitalitychannel.tv. There is a linear program that we keep infusing the new shows into so you can watch. We are going to have an Adele day, just so you know, Adele. And we're going to have a Dean day, just so you know. All shows that you've been connected to up 
but because I have enough for the past two years now for both of you to say, yeah, I got plenty of shows I can run a whole day with. Um, and also the podcast and things that you all do. So those will be there. Uh, I will we'll let you pick your days. Um, but there is a linear TV program to that. There's also an on demand that's slowly rolling out with more content uh, based on the uh, the archives that we keep loading into this channel. You can still find the show at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. There's the full archive all the way back to 2014. Uh, that we've when we first started uh, that you can go to also the podcast hospitality marketing podcast for those that don't know also to Dean's podcast meta search uh, we also have a um, a sales podcast with Holly we also have a revenue management podcast with Lily uh, our thoughts are with her right now with her and her family just so for people know that may know into Lily more more personally um, and of course uh, Tim Peter has his Tim Peter uh, podcast um, Melissa was with us earlier but uh, was it travel boom travel boom is travel boom Yep. Travel Boom, uh, used to be Full Travel, awesome podcast still uh, is out there. So there's lots of great content to be found on all these different platforms. Um, and of course, we have our TV channel, which is on Apple TV, Google, uh, Amazon Prime, and Apple TV. Um, did I miss one? Where do I want to miss? Oh, Roku, uh, that you can watch, which is both on demand and free. The live show is always free, but there's content that's going to start going behind the wall for paid uh, subscription for that as well. So with that in mind, thank you all very much, Dean and Dell, especially. Uh, thank you very much as always for your time on Friday and uh, for everyone uh, in the United States. Uh, happy July 4th weekend. Uh, for those of us in Florida, button up, we're going to have a hurricane. Uh, and for everybody across the pond, like Ben and Tris. Yeah, right. <laughs> and for, for those people who are about to go and blow some stuff up, Get out your your red shirt. The, I might not make it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have worn my Scotty shirt today. All right. Thank you all. Happy July 4th uh, to everyone and everyone watching with us. And remember, we do simulcast this back again, Sydney time and London time, 1130 a.m. Wednesdays for both of those time zones uh, for them, everyone as well on HSMAI's platforms as well. So uh, thank you, everybody. Adele, Dean, <laughs> weekend. Everybody. we'll see everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.